Greetings again today in the name of Jesus Christ, our wonderful Lord and Savior. Good to see you here in the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church today. We welcome every one of you. We have several visitors. We're delighted to have you here with us today to worship with us here at Northside. And you that's listening out in the radio listed audience, we most certainly appreciate you tuning in to the Northside Baptist Church Hour that's coming to you live right from the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church here in Athens. And this is Preacher Edward speaking. We're hoping during the hour coming up, we can be a real inspiration to everyone. So you in the radio listen audience, if you get on your phone and call a friend, especially a shut-in, have them to tune in. Get the Northside Baptist Church Hour. I feel like we can be a blessing to them. I want you to take your Bible today and turn to 1 Kings chapter 18. It's page 412 in the original Schofield Reference Bible. By the way, I do have three original Schofield Reference Bibles on hand. So all I do have is two of the regular size, one small size. The regular size of burgundy in color and the small size black. In case you're interested in a Scopio Bible around Christmas time. I only have three left. I won't have any more before or after Christmas. So I just wanted to make mention of that. And so you turn to 1 Kings chapter 18. Last three Sundays I've been talking about the man Elijah. I'm going to speak today on this subject. Elijah on Mount Carmel. I want to find out what happened to this man on Mount Carmel. I want you to turn in the Bible to that place. While you're turning there, I want to say this message and the music today will be on tape 259. Tape 259 and the message, Elijah on Mount Carmel. You can get these tape for $3 each and the gift is used to help defray our radio expense. Go right in and get a list of our tape. We'll send you a list of at least 250 of our cassette tape. And we have all kind of tapes around here. Brother John Bruce has uh, his piano solos on tape. And then uh, uh, Brother Tony, he has tape of he and his wife, I believe. The Blessed Hope singers have tape. And uh, Brother Gibson has a tape of his singing. I believe the song that he and uh, Brother Griffith sings together, We Need the Prayers of Those Who Love. I believe that's on that tape, and that's very beautiful. And you can write to my mailing address and uh, ask about these tapes. I think most of them are $3 each. Now, the tape I'm sending out is $3. Some may have tape a little higher, but they're in nice fixed boxes that they've added to the tape that increase the cost of the tape. I believe the Blessed Hope Singers will have that if they don't have it already. But you keep that in mind. And then write in and get the beautiful calendars. I have them here in my hand for the audience to see. We have these beautiful calendars. It's about seven, eight different colors here. Red and rose and gold and brown and green and orange, black and white. Well, they're real beautiful. Good to have in your home. You see so many calendars today that it's disgraceful to hang in anybody's home, a place of business. That is the pictures they have on them. And this is a good testimony. Write in and get your calendar, more than one, if you can place them where they can be used. Just request the calendar. We get it to you at your request. You can request it in your Christmas card. At this time of the year, we appreciate the beautiful Christmas cards that people send us, letting us know that the Holy, Holy Land Tour, one of the greatest we've set up thus far, eight days in Israel, two days in Geneva, Switzerland, a 10-day Holy Land Tour. Some of you people have reached retirement age and never taken a trip of this type. You ought to think about it. And maybe some of you in the radio listen audience, maybe your pastor's never been. Why don't you get busy and send your pastor, your pastor's wife, or send a friend? It's a real, real trip of a lifetime. They have to walk on the ground where Jesus walked. Now, we'll be leaving it on March the 10th. But we must get our names on the list. See, they have to make plans there in Asheville, Wilcox Tours, in regard to uh, motels and food and everything like that, plane tickets. And they need their names on the list, of course, of those that's going. And you only pay a $100 down payment. 
The balance will be due after the first of the year, around the middle of January. In case of emergency, and you can't go, you can get your money back, except maybe a little small fee. And so write in and say, Preach Edward, send me the brochure. Remember, time is running out. You need to do something about it. And uh, I, I'm zealous for you. I want you to go because I know what to do for you. So you keep that in mind. And I hope you found the place in your Bible, 1 Kings 18. I was reading the other day about this man that had to go to the dentist. And he was running late. And he had to rush into the dentist. And he rushed in at breakneck speed and jumped out of his car and went into the office. And the dentist checked him out and said, man, you have teeth that will last you the rest of your days on this earth. Man said, you mean to tell me my teeth are all that good? He said, no, they're not all that good. I just saw the way you drove into the driveway out there. And so maybe your teeth can last you the rest of your days. If you go out here and ride at breakneck speed, who knows? First Kings chapter 18. My mailing address is Virgil Edwards, P.O. Box 501, Athens, Georgia, 30603. Is a zip code number. Let me hear from you next week. 1 Kings chapter 18, I'll read a few verses, get right into the message. And it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go show thyself unto Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. And Elijah went to show himself unto Ahab, and there was sore famine in Samaria. Now I wish I had time today to read this entire chapter because my message is based upon most of this chapter, and you can read it for yourself, and I'll be giving you other scripture from the chapter. Now this man Elijah was a rugged mountaineer, a hairy man. He wore hairy clothes, skins of animals, and reared in the mountains, and a rugged prophet of God. In fact, Elijah is coming back again during the tribulation period, back down to this earth, Revelation chapter 11. He'll be back, according to the word of God. But he was a rugged prophet, and he prayed. He had a prayer meeting. He said, God, Israel sinned. And you tell us in your word when they sinned, you'd stop up the heavens that they might repent. This old prophet began to pray that God would stop up the heavens that rain not. And for three and a half years, it didn't rain a drop on the earth. In answer to his prayer. Then time came for him to unstop the heavens. He prayed again. He said, Lord, send the rain. And God sent the rain after Israel had repented. Now this man faced something very serious as a prophet in his lifetime. He faced a great famine. In verse 2, there was a sore of famine in the land. Now you think about what had happened to a country that didn't have any rain for three and a half years. When they depended upon the dew and the rain for their vegetation and whatnot, and no dew came, not even dew or rain, for three and a half years. That was a sore famine in Samaria, the Bible tells us, there in the land. And the, the Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter 11, verses 13 through 17, if Israel sinned, that God would stop up the heavens, and that he did. And then he faced a fearfulness. He had to be a man with a backbone because old King Ahab was after his hide. He wanted to kill him. He hated him with a passion. Old Lady Jezebel, uh, Ahab's wife, was the most wicked woman that we've ever known from the word of God. And she wanted to kill him because she had put to death many of God's people and prophets in those days. In verse 4, for it was so when Jezebel cut off the prophets of the Lord that Obadiah took a hundred prophets and hid them by fifty in a cave and fed them with bread and water. This old woman, this daughter of the priest of Baal, there put God's people to death. She killed out the preachers. She did everything she could to destroy Christianity. Now, the, rather, the uh, Judaism, they believed in uh, Judaism in those days. In the Old Testament, Christ had not come at this time. But anyway, the priests and, and many of the Levites had gone back to Jerusalem. And there's no priest and Levites here in the tribe of, of Israel at this time. They'd gone back to Judea, to the two tribes, and none in the ten tribes. The, the tribes of Israel had split. 
Israel had ten tribes in one group and two tribes in another. And the Levites and the priests had gone back to Jerusalem. They were without them and the land was given over to idolatry. They worshipped a son god Baal. And there the whole land had turned to this idol, this sun god. No lady Jezebel hated the people of God. And she was a, a, after old man Elijah because he was a man that stopped up the heavens. She and old King Ahab, they'd give anything if they could find him. He appeared on the scene. He went to the White House as it were. Stuck his finger on Ahab's nose and said it's not going to rain until I say so. And then he departed. And they wanted to find him. They searched everywhere. But for about a year we find he sat down with the rook keys. And God fed him with the ravens. And had the ravens to bring in sandwiches and food for him. And he drank out of the brook for about a year. God dried up the brook and said to go to Zarephath. He went to Zarephath. And there God let a widow woman and her little boy uh, take care of his needs there in their home. God supplied their need when all their food had run out. And for about two years, he remained there. So they couldn't find him for three years, almost three and a half years. And of course, in those days, they had some fence straddlers. And some would want to be on one side and worship Baal. Others want to worship Jehovah. And they would uh, kind of bounce back and forth from one to another in the way of their worship. They were called fence straddlers. In verse 21, Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long hold you between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. If Baal, then follow him. Now God wants people that will be true in following him. You can't say good God on Sunday and the good devil on Monday. God wants people to live for him seven days a week. But they had some fence straddlers here that wanted to worship Baal and then, of course, wanted to follow after Jehovah and they could not get settled. Elijah the Tishbite said, I want you to take a stand. If you're for God, if you're for Jehovah, I want you to take a stand for Jehovah. If you want to worship Baal, the heathen God, then all right, that's up to you, but I want you to make up your minds. I don't mind reading the story about during the Civil War, there was a soldier that lived up near the Mason-Dixon line. He didn't want to fight for the North. He didn't want to fight for the South. So he put him on a gray coat and a blue pair of pants, went up on the lines, and of course the South shot him in the shoulders, and the North got him in the pants, in the legs. So he got it from both sides. Now you can't do that. If you compromise, you're going to get it from both sides. So the only true thing to do is to really live for God seven days a week. Not only did he face these fence straddlers, but he also faced fanaticism. When he called a showdown on Mount Carmel, and I've been near that place, I've seen it with my own eyes, there on Mount Carmel. When he called a showdown, said, I want Israel to come to Mount Carmel. I want you to bring 450 prophets of Baal. They had 450 prophets of Baal, and then, of course, they had 400 prophets that sat around Jezebel's table. They were the little chaplains of Jezebel in those days. Had 750 of them, but the 450 prophets of Baal, they're the ones Elijah wanted to face. And here we find the man of God facing these 450 prophets, facing old King Ahab, facing the nation of Israel. And he said, we're going to have a showdown on Mount Carmel. We'll find out just who God is. And so they went to Mount Carmel in verse 26 of this chapter. And they took the bullock which was given them and they dressed it. And they uh, uh, called on the name of Baal from morning until noon saying, O Baal, hear us. But there was no voice, nor any that answered. And they leaped upon the altar which was made. Now Elijah said, we'll find out who God is. We'll find out whether I'm right or you're right. We'll go to the top of Mount Carmel and you get your little offering there. Uh, get your bullock and place it on your altar. And then you pray that fire will come and consume it. If fire comes down and consumes your offering, then Baal is the God. And then I will put an offering on the altar, a bullock, and I'll place it there. And I'll pray. And if fire comes down and consumes the offering there, then we serve Jehovah God. They said, we'll agree. That's right. We'll do that. 
And the prophets of Baal, 450, put their little offering on the altar. And they began to pray. They said, oh, Baal, send the fire, send the fire, consume the offering. For about three hours they prayed. And then they became frustrated and began to jump up and down upon the offering and began to cut themselves and shed their own blood, trying to get an answer from Baal. That old Harry prophet walked around and he said, well, maybe you need to pray a little louder. Maybe Baal's gone to sleep. Maybe he's taking a journey. Might be at home looking at TV. You better yell a little louder. If you want him to hear you, then cry louder and louder. They begin to scream and to cry. Maybe he's going to the football game this afternoon. You need to really pray. Your God, you need to really call on him. We'll tell you where he is. Maybe going Christmas shopping this Sunday afternoon. You don't know where he is. Now you need to pray. Pray louder. And he made all kind of fun of those false prophets of Baal. And for three hours, they cut themselves with stones and jumped upon their offering. And they got no answer from Baal. Elijah, the man of God, said, Now step aside. Let me see if my God will come to my rescue. And there the old Harry prophet, a lone man, standing before all those false prophets and the nation of Israel and those people looking on from far and near. There he saw an old altar where Israel one time worshipped God. And he repaired that old altar. And then he set up 12 stones representing the 12 tribes of Israel. And then he dug trenches around the offering they placed on the altar. And he placed it there, no doubt, in the form of a cross. Placed on the altar. And he said, I want you to go get some water. They went and got four barrels of water and poured it all around in those trenches. He wanted to be sure that nobody could say any fire had been slipped under there. He wanted water all around that offering. They brought four barrels of water out of the Mediterranean Sea up on the top of Mount Carmel. There's a drought in the land. They had to get the water from the sea and Mount Carmel is near the sea. And then he said, go and get four more barrels. They went and got four more barrels of water. They poured that in the trenches. They saturated the uh, offering. And then he said, go and get four more barrels. They went and got four more barrels. It's made 12, representing the 12 tribes of Israel. He poured that water out. And he said, all right, now let's pray. Oh, man, Elijah got out on his knees and began to cry to God. He said, oh, God, I want you to send the fire down from heaven. I want you to show these false prophets just who God is around here. I want you to show them who's right and who's wrong. Oh God, we want you to send the fire. Now we find what Elijah did. He put Israel on the spot in verse 21. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And then he put Elijah put Israel on the spot. He also put Baal's prophets on the spot in verse 24. Call you on the name of your gods. I will call on the name of the Lord. And the God that answers by fire. Let him be God. So he put the prophets of Baal on the spot. And then he put God on the spot in verse 24. It tells us there that he prayed to God. And asked God to do what he promised. And God did what he promised. Then he put himself on the spot. And verse 26, uh, 36 and 37. It came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. That Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, that I am thy servant, that I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God, that thou hast turned their heart back again. Beloved, when he prayed that prayer, calling on Jehovah God, something happened. Notice what happened when Elijah took his stand. The fire of the Lord fell. If you want the fire of God in your life, the Holy Spirit of God to control you, you must take a stand for something. God can never bless weak need people. You must take your stand. We find in verse 38, the fire fell. The fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. When he prayed for the fire, the fire came down and burned up the wood, licked up the water, licked up the dust, and 
consumed the stones. That was a mighty fire of God. Then to be sure it consumed the offering he had there on the altar. Israel was restored now back to true worship. When all of those people saw that God Jehovah had heard Elijah, then they began to cry out, Elijah, he is God. He is the true God. And there they restored back to worship. In verse 39, And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, he is the God. The Lord, he is God. The whole nation of Israel on those mountains fell down upon their faces and began to say, Elijah is right. Elijah brought fire down from heaven. Elijah is very God. Jehovah is his very God. Now Elijah had to face a lot of fanaticism that day on Mount Carmel. Those of prophets of Baal became fanatical. They jumped up and down. They screamed. They hollered. Uh, they cut themselves. They bruised their bodies. They shed their own blood on the altar hoping that would help get an answer. And they turned out to be fanatics. There's a lot of fanaticism in the world today that's not true to the Bible. You take these snake handlers. Some time ago, I saw a service that showed on the TV screen uh, a church where they were handling these snakes, reaching down and picking up snakes and handling them. Well, that's fanaticism. God never told man to deliberately take up a snake and handle that snake. In Mark, the last chapter, God told the apostles the apostles and disciples, if they got accidentally bit by a snake, he would take care of them. And Paul got bit by a snake and God took care of him. When they expected him to drop dead in a second, he remained alive and that was literally minutely fulfilled. God never intended for fanatics to take that scripture and go out handling snakes. At any time, a group of people that become religious fanatics and started handling snakes in a service and those snakes bite them, they are committing suicide. They may do it through ignorance, but they're committing suicide. Sometimes they drink poison and die from that. That's fanaticism, the worst kind. That's not pleasing to God. Over in the Middle East today, in Lebanon, you have one of the most fanatical group of religious people in the world today, and that's those um, Islamic people over there that's fighting and call themselves the fighters of God, the servants of God. And they call themselves fundamentalists. And they have been taught if they would go out and kill an enemy, that immediately they'd go into paradise of God and get a special reward. That's what they've been taught by the false prophets, their leaders, the fathers of Mohammedan, the Ayatollah, and all that crowd. And those young boys, some of them in their teens, will go out and fight deliberately hoping that they would be killed in battle, that they might go straight to paradise and they'll be rewarded. And the more people they kill, they call their enemies, especially Americans, the more they could kill, the greater would be their reward. That fanatic that drove that uh, automobile or truck into that uh, th those barracks over there, uh, motel or hotel or whatever, those Marines went and killed all those Marines, while they claim, why he, he gets an untold number of rewards in heaven, in paradise for that. Well, the moment he blowed himself up, he opened his eyes in hell. All of those people know nothing about God. They know nothing about Jesus Christ. They're a bunch of fanatics, uh, know nothing about God, demonized and led by the spirit of Satan. They are fanatics. And you have fanatics in America in religious realms. You've got to be aware of these fanatics that move contrary to the Word of God. Now, it's all right to be a fanatic for Jesus if you're straight in the Bible. That word fanatic means a fan. It's all right to be a fan of Jesus if you're straight in the Bible. If you're a fanatic for Jesus, straight in this book, love God, amen, more power to you. But if you're a fanatic contrary to the Word of God, then that's not good. Beware of these fanatics. And he had to face that on Mount Carmel. And the fire came. Israel repented to, because of its sin. Repented to God in verse 39. And then Elijah, whenever he saw all Israel on the face before God, there stood 450 false prophets of Baal, trembling in their boots. 
Elijah said, don't you let a one of these escape. Not a one. Surround every one of them. They had strong men of Israel there nearby. And they surrounded every one of those 450 false prophets of Baal. Elijah said, march them down to the river of Keith. They marched them down to the river of Keith. Elijah said, head chopping off time has come to Israel today. I want you to cut every last one of them's head off down here in this river. Throw them in the river. Cut their heads off. And the river Keith began to flow with the blood of the false prophets of Baal. God had told him to do that in the Old Testament. God said they should be put to death because they were false prophets and there they should be put to death. Elijah was only doing what God said to. God said destroy these false prophets. Get them out of the land. If you don't, they'll turn the people back to Baal and begin to worship the idol of Baal, the false god Baal. Kill every one of them. Get rid of them. Because we throw them around. And when they destroyed those false prophets, God blessed them and they began to move forward for God. Beloved, in order to have the blessings of God upon you, you must get rid of your idols. You cannot hold on to your idols and have God's best for your life. You can't do it. In verse 40, it said, And I, Elijah said unto them, Take the prophets of Baal, let not one of them escape. But they, and they took them, and Elijah brought them down the brook Kishon and slew them there. Now whenever he brought them down and slew them, a great revival broke out. God sent abundance of rain. A little cloud came up, and we'll bring a message on that maybe in a couple of weeks. A little cloud came up, and there God sent a flood. God sent the rain. And a great revival came there in Israel when the showdown came. Now when the showdown comes and people make up their minds, they're going to serve God and not say good God on Sunday and good devil on Monday, but stand for square for God seven days a week, then the blessings can come. We can't be wavering, hypocritical about it. We must stand for God if we expect God's blessings. And the showdown came. There may be a time in your life when God speaks to you and lets you know you must put everything on the altar. The showdown time has come. Make up your mind. Are you going to serve God? Are you going to serve the devil in the world? Make up your mind. If you're going to stand for God, the fire will come. The blessings will come. That, that's for every individual and also for every church. You stand for God, that which is right, you expect God's blessings. If you get off in error, if you play around hypocritical about it, you cannot have the real divine blessings of God. And Elijah said, let's get rid of the false prophets. And he did. And the rain came. The floods came. It hadn't rained for three and a half years. God sent a gully washer. And God began to bless the land. And the people turned back to God. They said, away with Baal. Away with this false God. We want the true Jehovah God. And they turned back to God. And that's when they got the blessing. I was reading the other day. I heard a preacher other tell it on tape I believe. He's telling about many years ago. When Dwight L. Moody was in the prime of his ministry. And great crowds were coming out to hear him preach. And they had to turn far more people away from the auditoriums. Where he preached and they got on the inside. Dwight L. Moody came up to the church to go in for the service one night. He was kind of a stout fellow and had one of these Prince Albert coats on. And, and a little boy was standing there crying. And Dwight looked down at that little boy. He said, Sonny boy, he said, uh, what's wrong? What are you crying about? And he began to snub. He said, Mr. Said, uh, uh, Mr. Moody is going to preach tonight. And I've heard about Mr. Moody. And I, I want to see him and I want to hear him. And and said, sir, they won't let me in. They tell me I can't let go in to see Mr. Moody and hear Mr. Moody. And he just began to sob. And Mr. Moody said, listen, son, I'll tell you what you do. You take a hold of my coattail. And you follow me wherever I go. That little boy kindly hid under Dwight L. Moody's coattail. And followed him through the door and into the building and down to the platform. And Dwight set the little fellow down there at the platform. And he heard Dwight L. Moody preach. He didn't know it was Dwight L. Moody until 
They got on the inside and the man got up to preach. And whenever he finished preaching, Dwight L. Moody finished preaching, that little old boy came forward, got out on his knees and gave his heart to Jesus and God saved him. That little boy was named Paul Rader. Paul Rader became one of the greatest preachers in America. He grew up from a child serving God. And he never got tired telling about how he held to a man's coattail and went in the house of God and got saved. He told it in his meetings and everywhere he went. Paul Rader was a great and mighty man of God. He got in, but he had to go in by holding a man's coattail, the preacher's coattail, but the preacher got him in. And he got saved and became a great preacher. It's always best to serve God and be on God's side. If you believe that, say amen. amen. Let's stand to our feet. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray today that you'll take the message and use it. We know a mighty showdown came on Mount Carmel. And Jehovah God sent the fire. But he didn't send it till his children, the people, the nation of Israel made up their minds to whom they were going to serve. And they made up their minds to serve thee. God, speak to hearts here today. Have your way in this invitation. We thank you for what it was accomplished in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, Debbie's going to play for us on the instrument as she plays. If you're in this building and you're unsaved and you want to be saved, if you'll come down here, we'll help you to the Lord. If you're backslidden on God and you want to come back to the Lord, you may come. We'll help you. I'll be here. Tony will be standing here. We'll help you. If you're here and you feel like you'd like to join the Northside Baptist Church, by letter, by statement, as a candidate for baptism, in a way receive members, you may come forward. And if God is speaking to your heart, you obey God. That's all I ask you to do is obey God. You do what the Lord tells you. I brought you the message. It's up to you now to respond. While she plays and while we wait, will you obey the Lord? Backslidden, you desire this church to be your church, you want to be a part of it. While we wait, would you come? Maybe you like the Israel, you were halted between two opinions. You decide today you're going to stay on God's side, be on God's side. You want to come to this altar and tell God about it, feel free. While we wait. 